I have no idea. Uh, oh, it's on now. There we go. Sorry, I tried a minute ago and it wasn't on, so. Hello. I'm Mark Rendell, and this is the last talk of the conference, or one of the last talks of the conference. Uh, this is all about why I'm not leaving .NET um, just for a change, because uh, hands up who's read a why I'm leaving .NET blog post any time in the last 20 years. Yeah. Um, people, people get all, they either get stressed with .NET and throw their toys out of the pram and go, I'm stomping off to another ecosystem, or they go, oh, shiny thing, and have to go chasing after something else. And there's lots of places that they go and things that they do and reasons that they leave. And I've kind of stuck with it all this time, and there have been good times, and there have been bad times, and there has been silver light. Um, <laughs> but currently, I think .NET is uh, possibly the best it's ever been, and I wanted to show you a few of the things that I think are really cool about it. So nothing's going to go too in-depth. I know at this stage of the conference, everyone's kind of, uh, uh, there was a party last night, and you don't want me to be sitting here going, so if we tweak this XML file here, we can change the way that bytecode is generated. So I'm not going to do any of that. I'm just going to show you a bunch of cool stuff that I've been playing with or that I've been monitoring the progress of and uh, hopefully give you some ideas of stuff that you can go and play with. And I promise I won't clap again because that was really loud. All right. So the problem is, and this is true in software development generally, the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. So you're sitting there doing whatever you're doing and whatever you're doing it in, and then you read something and you go, you know, like 10 years ago it was Rails. Rails, you can build a whole web application just by typing commands and then go into production and get $50 million from Silicon Valley venture capitalists. Um, even in .NET itself, you're kind of going, oh, Entity Framework, but then there's Dapper, oh, Dapper, but then there's Petapoco and stuff. So, and developers are a notoriously fickle people, and they will jump to other things for a variety of different reasons. Um, one of the ones that we've seen a lot of over the last five years or so is people are going, uh, oh, Node.js. Lots of people have kind of dived onto Node.js and gone, performance, it's, it's web scale. Node.js is the fastest web framework. You just use Express and you throw things together and it's all JavaScript on the server and JavaScript on the client. And it's really, really fast. And the thing is, Node.js is very fast and very scalable at the things that Node.js is very fast and very scalable for, which is getting stuff from one place and sending it to another place. That's it. It's basically a networking protocol. Um, as soon as you say to Node.js, generate me a GUID, it goes, right, everything stop, I'm generating a GUID, hold on for two milliseconds, all right, I've done it, and then everything else gets to carry on. I wrote a web bug tracking thing for one of the sponsors out there, actually, I won't name which one, um, and every time a, a request came in, it put this little one by one pixel onto the page, but every time it did that, it generated three UUIDs, as they're called in Node, and it would only serve 800 requests a second, because generating UUIDs is a slow operation, and it was doing it's single-threaded. So when it's doing it, that's it, CPU bound, it's locked up. But people think that ASP.NET is slow, and ASP.NET, the full-fat framework ASP.NET, is not great, and running it on mono, it's not great. But now we have ASP.NET Core, and this is the Tech Empower benchmarks. If you don't know what these are, uh, these guys came up with a series of different benchmark applications, and they implement them in lots and lots and lots of different stacks, frameworks, languages, all this sort of stuff, and then they compare them. And they produce this benchmark chart every three months or so, and you can contribute your own things. And ASP.NET Core running on Linux is on this chart, and it's in about 15th place, I think. ASP.NET Core on Linux, on the hardware that they're using, will do 1.7 million requests a second. That's ASP.NET Core 2.0 running on .NET Core 2.0 running on a Linux server. That's fast, okay? The stuff above it, there's some Java things up there. There's Netty and Java, we're catching up to Java. 
but they've got NIO and they've got cool things. There's some stuff coming in .NET Core 2.1 that's going to help us catch up a bit further, and we're going to jump up that list a little bit further. The thing right at the top is C. And how do you compete with C? You know, if someone's going to go, I'm writing my web application in C and C++, you're just going to go, right, fine. That's, that's going to be really fast until it crashes because you forgot to deallex some memory. Um, so yes, ASP.NET Core is, is very fast, or at least it is for plain text stuff. Um, as soon as you get into some of the other benchmarks, like JSON serialization or anything that does database access, it starts to slow down again because Kestrel, which is the ASP.NET Core web server, has had a lot of very clever people kind of going, oh, we can treat all the HTTP methods, get, put, post, patch, delete options, whatever. Um, they're all less than eight bytes, so therefore we can turn them into a long and do a switch statement against a, it's just bonkers stuff. Um, so yeah, that's nice. Um, so, but that's getting faster, but the rest of the framework is still lagging behind. It does lots of allocations and everything, but they're starting to introduce a bunch of primitives into .NET uh, Core 2.1 and some more language features into C Sharp 7.2 that are going to make things even faster. So .NET Core 2.1, we've got this new thing called span of T. So instead of having byte arrays and passing byte arrays around, which is a heap allocated object, we have this span of T, and you can have a span of byte that either points to a byte array or a subset of a byte array or some unmanaged memory that you've got using unsafe code and asking for a pointer and p invoking malloc or other sorts of things. And span is a struct, and so you can pass it around and it doesn't cause any heap allocations. Um, and this is providing the ability to make some very, very fast code. And they've introduced, they've added support for span of byte to a lot of things that previously took a byte array. So you can now say, copy this span of byte onto a stream directly. Um, and we've got, uh, there's a UTF-8 formatting class uh, where you can say, take this integer and turn it into a UTF-8 string version. So you've got 42, and it writes the bytes for four and two to the stream. And so we can do a lot of things without hitting the garbage collector in the heap at all, which makes things really, really fast. And C Sharp's got support for these, uh, this span type. It's got ref locals and ref returns, so we don't have to copy values as much. We're getting some really, really low level, hardcore primitives that are letting the guys who write the plumbing code that we use to build our applications make that plumbing code incredibly light and fast. And so we're gonna see performance just getting even better from now on. You've got in parameters and read-only struct as well, which is great for kind of safe programming. Um, you can say, I created this struct, you can't change it. If you want to change it, make another copy of it with different values um, and that sort of thing, so we can enforce that now. And then in C-sharp 8, we've got nullable reference types, where, so you think your code is null safe and that it's not gonna crash and it's not gonna give any null reference exceptions. When C Sharp 8 comes along, it's going to be a compiler flag to turn this on. And it will be off by default, but they're going to let you turn it on and then try and compile your code. And it will tell you every single place. I really don't want to do this at work. <laughs> um, every single place in your code where you could potentially get an old reference exception. I guarantee you there's going to be hundreds of them. Just set aside a sprint or two to fix them all. So yes. Um, I was sort of learning about all this stuff and reading about it, and I thought, I want to try an experiment. I've got this theory, okay? When I create microservices, what I tend to have is you have posts and puts and patches that are coming in, and you get the object, and you validate the object, and maybe send back some errors, or maybe store it into a database, like MS SQL Server, or Postgres, or MySQL, or whatever it is. So for the right side, that's, that's great, and you don't get writes happening that often. But you get a lot of queries. 90% of database accesses are queries. People want to know what data's in the database. And what those queries are doing in a .NET application is they're going, right, get the data out of the database. If you want it to be fast, you use Dapper. And you say, Dapper, turn this DB data reader into objects. And so Dapper creates 1,000 objects in memory, and then it passes them over to JSON.NET, and JSON.NET turns them all into UTF-8 bytes of JSON and then sends that down the stream. And I thought, what if you take that middle step out? What if you just go from the DB data reader and just write it straight to the stream as JSON? So I wrote this thing called Beeline. 
And um, where are where are we? So Beeline basically does this. And Beeline only works on .NET Core 2.1 because it's using these span types and everything, okay? So we've got, um, we've got a row, an object writer. So you give this a uh, DB data reader and it turns it into a JSON object. Um, and you can see that what we pass in to this thing here is a memory of byte. So memory is like span, but it's a reference type because there are so many restrictions on what you can do with span. Um, so you have this memory thing that makes it a bit easier. So we pass this memory thing in here, but then the row serializer um, gets this span of byte, which is so new that every single IDE I have, Visual Studio 2017 Preview 15.6, uh, the actual Visual Studio, JetBrains Rider up-to-date version, by the way, if you haven't tried Rider, give it a try, it is really awesome, um, and Visual Studio Code all say you can't use a span of byte. Funnily enough, when I go to the command line and say .NET build, it goes, yeah, it's fine. So ignore the, ignore the red squiggles. But yes, so we have this span, it comes in and we, we say, right, I want to get the first two bytes, so I'm going to do buffer.slice, and that creates another span. Still no allocations, because it's just returned another span that's a subset of the previous span. And then we write things across to this, and the writers are all just, um, let me find a writer. So yeah, there's an int32 writer. Um, and what that's basically doing is using this UTF-8 formatter um, to format an int32 onto a byte buffer. So there's no to string involved at any point here. It is just going, this is how this would look as UTF-8 bytes. There's a UTF-16 formatter as well and a UTF-32 formatter. I don't know what they're for. What the hell are we still doing with either of those UTFs? What, what are they? I, no, no. I invented UTF-256 which um, is 256-bit encoding, which is essentially large enough for every single photograph or picture or anything ever taken in the history of mankind to be encoded in a font. Useful, right? Yeah. So yes, and I, I wrote this, and it's got these spans and things all over the place, and then somebody else contributed back uh, some, some uh, additional... Uh, refinements to it, a guy called Tim Seward, you may know him on Twitter, he's, uh, yeah, he's, he's all about the, where am I going, I don't know, um, all about the optimizations and all this sort of stuff, the other, the other guy is Ben Adams, who contributed an awful lot of the fixes to Kestrel, um, so yes, if I go into test and beeline.benchmarks and artifacts and results, so I'm using this thing called benchmark.net, um, as if you haven't seen benchmark.net yet, if you're kind of writing your low-level stuff and you want to know which is faster, this way of doing it or that way of doing it, or I think I've optimized this, but I don't know, benchmark.net lets you write performance unit tests, basically. You can say, do this, and it does it like a thousand times, and it does the other one a thousand times, and it takes care of warm-up, and it watches memory allocations and all this sort of stuff. And then you can go, right, so this way takes a little bit longer but uses less memory, or this way is faster and uses less memory, and so forth. So we've used benchmark.net to benchmark this, going straight from a DB data reader to the network stream, um, and compared it to Dapper and Entity Framework. And the results uh, came out as NA, which is interesting. Okay. Uh, taking Dapper and JSON.NET out of the equation, that is really annoying. That's, that's worked every single time, except now. This is my NDC curse. Um, uh, basically, uh, the Beeline way of doing it, this, this new low performance, low overhead, high performance way of doing it, is 20% faster than Dapper, which is actually, you're kind of like going, wow. Because <laughs> Dapper's been the standard for doing this sort of thing quickly. And just by taking out that step of creating a bunch of objects that we don't really need and then turning them into JSON and just going the shortest possible distance between two points, we've managed to shave 20% of the time off. It also uses less than half the memory. And performance is getting increasingly important because now 
we're not sort of spinning up a big server and running everything on a big server or maybe a pair of servers with mirroring. We're spinning up clusters of Docker servers and Kubernetes clusters in the cloud. And we want to run lots and lots and lots of different things on these one cluster. And we want to run multiple instances of them. And the more things we can cram in, the higher density we can achieve on this kind of cluster hosting, then the less we have to pay at the end of the month when the Azure bill comes in or the AWS bill comes in. So doing this kind of low-level performance stuff is actually worthwhile. And I think we're going to see .NET getting a lot faster because of that. So that's quite cool. Um, the next thing is uh, Go. A lot of people have kind of gone running over to Go. And the thing that Go has going for it is native compilation. So you write the code, and you build it, and it creates a native statically linked executable that you can just take and run on any machine. There's no runtime required. Uh, you can build it on Linux, and it'll go and run on Linux machines. You can build it for Windows. It'll run on Windows machines with a .exe thing. And so that's quite cool as well. And it would be nice if we could do that in a language that looks like it was designed after 1970. Um, <clears throat> because basically, Go, the way you make a language like Go is you put someone into suspended animation in 1970, and then you wake him up now, and you don't tell him about any of the developments in programming over the last 40 years, and you say, make a new programming language. Um, so yes. Does anyone know what picha wanji kok patang nangi tu chan ki troi means? Any guesses? I will not give up my favorite decoration. I watched the whole film for that one slide. There we go. <laughs> so um, it would be nice if we could do native compilation and create static linked executables uh, in .NET and, and use C Sharp to write these things with generics and you know async and await and all the cool stuff that we and link everything that we have in, in .NET that makes it so cool. Um, and we can because there's a project that's it's not going as well as they'd hoped and it's having some issues, but they're getting there called Core RT. And Core RT is an ahead of time compilation runtime and compiler for .NET. So you get your .NET application and you compile it to assemblies and DLLs, and then you pass those assemblies to Core RT and it runs them through Ryujit all at the same time. It's a bit like NGEN, okay, if you remember NGEN from the GAC, um, and turns them all into a single statically linked executable file that doesn't require a runtime. And I'm going to demo this, um, and I am actually demoing it right now, because this slide presentation deck is running in Slidey, which is my standalone command line presentation deck thing that I've written. Um, it's it's semi-functional, it works locally, it's supposed to be online features, but they're not working. Um, and I want to be able to distribute this to people. The idea came from Reveal.js, which is a node thing, and with that, it's kind of like, oh, really simple slide things. You can just use JavaScript and HTML or Markdown and then just launch your slideshow and it's fine. You're going, great, how do I run this incredibly simple slideshow thing? Well, install Node, and you're kind of like, okay, what? Um, so install Node and then install NPM and then clone this GitHub repository and then edit the slides file and then do an NPM restore and then run grunt, and you're just kind of like, what? So I wanted something similar to that, but where I could just put an exe up onto GitHub releases, and people could download that exe and run it locally. Um, and so I have actually achieved that using Core RT. Um, if I go to my uh, C drive and into bin, um, so got three files here, libuv.dll, which is what Kestrel uses to be a web server. Um, and then I've got slidey.exe, which is a 23 megabyte executable file. And that's it. I don't need the PDB file. It's just there because I accidentally copied it across. It's not necessary. Um, that slidey.exe file contains the core CLR, or the, the core RT version of the CLR. It's got the garbage collector. It doesn't have the jitter because it doesn't need the jitter because everything's already been jitted. And it contains native compiled pre-linked versions of all the code, not only for the .NET base class library, 
but also for most of the ASP.NET Core runtime. It's got routing in there, it's got MVC Core, it's got the options framework, the configuration framework, the dependency injection framework, and it's all wrapped up into a single .exe file. I could give you that .exe and that .dll, and you could put it on a machine that's never seen .NET in its life, and it would run. The really cool thing, the thing I love about this, is I've got Windows Subsystem for Linux on here, and I've installed all the necessary things on Windows Subsystem for Linux, and I can use that, and I can build a single statically linked executable file which doesn't have .exe on the end, and I can upload that to GitHub, and anyone can download that onto any Linux machine that's running a reasonably up-to-date kernel, and they'll be able to launch it as well. The only thing I can't create on this machine is a Mac executable, which doesn't bother me. <laughs> so yes, that's pretty cool. The thing that's really cool about it though, okay, so I'm gonna jump into uh, Dick CLI SRC slidey. Okay, so I'm gonna do, uh, can everyone see the PowerShell at the back there? All right, so I'm gonna do .NET run. This is how you launch this application um, from the command line. And I'm going to say use the release build. I have built this already, okay? So this is just running the code that I've built. It's, it's loading up all the ASP.NET framework, and it's jitting everything, and there you go. So there's a bit of a delay. So if this was just a command line application that I'd written to do something to process a bunch of files and produce some output or something, every time I was running it, it was going to take that long just to get to the first line of code that I actually wanted to run, okay? This slidey .exe is on my path, okay? So this is the natively compiled version. This is the full ASP.NET Core framework spinning up. Okay? So yeah, that's, that's um, <laughs> I, I like that demo, that's a good demo. Um, so yeah, we, we can do this now. We can, uh, without worrying about runtimes, without worrying about all this sort of stuff, we can create these native executables. Uh, this one is big because it's got the whole of ASP.NET included in it. I could trim it down. I could turn on features to kind of do aggressive um, tree shaking and not include code that's not going to be used, but that's still really, really alpha and it tends to break things. Um, but if you have, I've got a simple thing that takes a bunch of XML files that have been output from listening to Diagnostic Stopwatch and turns those into an HTML report and that is compiled the same way and it's five megabytes with the complete .NET runtime inside it as well, which actually is something that you can just go, here, I'll email that to you. And then the email server goes, no, that's an XE, you're not having that. Fishing. Um, but yes, so you can now create command line applications uh, that launch as quickly as if they were written in C or Go or Rust or anything else. That is not to say that C and Rust and Go don't have a place. Rust in particular, I am learning Rust, I like it a lot. Uh, there's a lot to be said for it, but I know C-sharp, I know .NET, and for me, the quickest and easiest way to write anything is like that, so that's why. Okay. So, moving on. People, a lot of people jumped ship to go and do mobile development, um, and they went, ah, oh, the future is in mobile and iPhones, mainly iPhones, also Android phones, but mainly iPhones. Android users tend to steal software, whereas iPhone users tend to pay for it, so that's where they went. Um, and at first, it was really terrible because they had to learn Objective-C. Any Objective-C developers in the room? Yeah. You know how you make Objective-C? You take the best bits of small talk and the best bits of C++ and you throw them away. And what's left is Objective-C. It's got better now because they've got Swift, which is somewhere between a ripoff of C-sharp and a ripoff of Kotlin. Um, but it's quite nice. Um, it's better, but it's still got some pain around it. If you want to write for Android natively, then you write Java um, or you use Kotlin, which is now an officially supported language, which is quite nice as well. But you have to write two versions of your application. Uh, you have to write the, an the Android one with all the Kotlin code, and you have to write the iOS one with all the Swift code. Um, or you can use JavaScript. Uh, you can use things like React Native and so forth and create applications using JavaScript and so forth. Or you can use Xamarin. I don't like the actual Xamarin monkey. I prefer this one. <laughs> so now with Xamarin, we have Xamarin Forms. And I wanted to come up here, because I have used Xamarin Forms to build a couple of test applications for some training videos that I'm working on. 
uh, which aren't ready yet, which means I can't sell them to you, which means I've just wasted a couple of days being here, really. I have nothing to benefit from this, but never mind. Uh, that's, that's my problem, not yours. Um, but no, Xamarin Forms, um, Xamarin has been around for a long time, and you have been able to share all your business logic code by compiling it as a portable class library or sharing the project, but you had to write all the UI code for Android using the whatever that XML format is they use for Android and for um, iPhone using Interface Builder and, and all these sorts of things. Now they've got Xamarin Forms, and Xamarin Forms lets you define your UI using XAML in a shared library and then include that into an iPhone project and an Android project and a UWP project and a Mac OS project. You can support all these different, um, these different formats. And in the latest version of uh, Xamarin Forms, um, it used to be that that shared library was a portable class library. Hands up who loves portable class libraries. You're a sick man, single person at the back. I saw that. So yeah, we've got .NET Standard now, um, which is really cool, and it's been explained previously in the conference, and so I'm not going to explain it, but I totally do understand it, honestly. Um, but so Xamarin have made .NET Standard work with XAML, and so we can now go into Visual Studio, um, and we can create a new project. I really shouldn't start Visual Studio live on stage during talks. Um, or we can just open a solution that I created earlier. Um, <clears throat> excuse to drink a glass of water. Come on. And what we have is a .NET standard project, which has got our XAML in it, which defines our user interface. And then we have an Android project, which literally just pulls that in and hooks it up to Android. And we can have an iOS project which just pulls that library in and hooks it up to um, iOS and a Mac OS one and a UWP one. So, because everybody wants to write Windows Store applications, right? Um, no? Okay. Uh, funny people. So yes, and I wanted to come up here and go, look, I can run this in Android and I can run it in, in uh, UWP. And um, it didn't work out. So here it is running in UWP. This is literally just the Hello World application. Um, I can't demo it on iOS because still, to build an iOS application, you need Xcode, and to get Xcode, you need a Mac. Um, so you have to have a Mac. You can write it on a Windows PC and have a Mac sitting on the network and then use that. You send the code over and it builds it and it sends it back, and you can do that with it. But there you go, here it is running in, in UWP. That's nice and easy. Um, here is the uh, this is the main page .xaml here. So yeah, we've got a, a label with the text "Hello NDC." So it's a sub. It's not WPF. It's not UWP. It's a kind of weird subset amalgam of various things. But you define your user interface once. The nice thing is that it then renders that like an Android application on Android, like an iOS application on iOS, like a macOS application on Mac and like a an UWP application. So you have this one UI. You can put all your business logic into net standard libraries. The bit that's actually specific to each platform is very, very small indeed. So you can be developing for all these platforms at the same time. Except I wanted to be able to kind of just very quickly switch and show you the same application running in Android um, or the Android emulator. But this is me, yesterday, trying to get Android emulation working <laughs> on my laptop. Anyone eating? Sorry. Um, yeah, I can't run the official Android emulator because I'm running Docker for Windows, and Docker for Windows runs in Hyper-V, and Hyper-V is a hypervisor layer, and when you enable Hyper-V in Windows 10, it actually runs Windows 10 inside the hypervisor because it has to run the hypervisor at the lowest possible level. It's an incredibly efficient hypervisor, and even with the hypervisor running, I can play Forza Motorsport 7 on my laptop as long as I wear headphones because, my God, the fans are loud. But, and I can't keep Forza Motorsport 7 on there because it's 130 gigabytes, but anyway, I can't run 
an emulator because the Android emulator, the official one, runs on Intel's hypervisor, which is called HaxM, and HaxM is a level zero hypervisor which can't run inside another hypervisor. The only hypervisor that you can run inside Hyper-V is Hyper-V. So you go, ah, damn it. And, and people, you, you go to Stack Overflow and say, Stack Overflow, how do I run the Android emulator? And they say, turn off Hyper-V. And you're like, but that, no, I'm not gonna like, turn off Hyper-V, reboot Windows and stop using Docker for as long as I'm building an Android application and then turn it back on again and reboot. It's just painful. And then someone's, I found a post going, just use the Microsoft em emulator for Android, which runs in Hyper-V. So I went and got that, but that doesn't work because Microsoft. Um, <laughs> it just doesn't. You go create the Hyper-V thing and it goes, yes, I'm doing it. And then it just hangs. Um, so I can't show you that. Uh, I have another laptop. <laughs> um, if you want to do mobile development, to be honest, the best way of doing it is to buy a Mac. And uh, use Xamarin, use Visual Studio for Mac. Uh, you can run a Mac, em you can run the iOS emulator on there. You can hook it straight into an iPad or an iPhone to do actual testing. And because it's a Mac, you can run the Android emulator on there because the Android emulator for Mac is really bloody good. So yes, if you want to do mobile development, just get a Mac, okay? Have a Windows PC as well for doing real grown-up stuff, um, but have a Mac for doing mobile development. So yes, the other thing you can do is that there is now something called Xamarin Live Player, which is actually something you install onto an iPad or onto an Android device. Um, and then you start it on the Android device and you scan a QR code that it generates for you in the Visual Studio window and it just links them together. And then you just go deploy to that Android device that I just linked you to. And it just puts your code across there. And you can actually, <laughs> you can change the XAML in Visual Studio and it instantly updates on the device. It's great, it's, and you can do step debugging and all this sort of stuff, so that's actually the easiest way to do it. Um, but still, the best, you know, if you want to do mobile development, you want to be doing it for iOS. If you want to do it for iOS, you need a Mac, so get a MacBook. It's a good excuse. So yes, we had a UWP demo there. Um, so then the other thing that people um, get excited about and want to go and do is game development. Um, and Game development traditionally has been uh, C and C++ thing. You have to learn DirectX or OpenGL and get like hardcore into C and C++ code and hook into engines and all this sort of stuff. Um, but just recently, I have started learning Unity um, with my daughter. And Unity is a full professional game engine. It can do pretty much everything that Unreal Engine can do. Um, and it has supports two scripting languages. One is JavaScript, no, and the other is C Sharp. And it hooks into Visual Studio, or it hooks into Rider, or it hooks into VS Code, and so you can open things up in Unity, and um, let's see if we can get this demo to work, shall we? This definitely worked 10 minutes ago downstairs. It does this regularly. I don't do anything in a professional capacity. That's just ridiculous. Okay, here we go. So this, this is actually just the, um, the game from a tutorial book that we're working through called uh, Unity Games by Tutorial, which is available on Amazon, costs 40 quid. I absolutely recommend it. But yes, it gives you the assets and all this sort of stuff, and you just create this game. Um, and this is what I've been doing with my daughter. And if we go and we look at, um, in here, we've got asset scripts. And if I click player controller, you can see here we've got some C-sharp code. If I double click it, it opens it in Visual Studio Code, which is what we've got it set up to do. Um, and we'll get that to go away. And so yeah, you can see here, we've just got using Unity Engine. You have a bunch of classes that derive from mono behavior because this kind of came out of mono uh, stuff, and then we just have standard C sharp code with generics, and uh, it supports .NET 2.0 at the moment, but they're bringing it up to standard, so it can become part of the net standard ecosystem, and it's going to support C sharp 7 and 7.1 and 7.2. Um, but you you just 
that, all that C-sharp knowledge that you use all day to get customers out of a database and display them in a web browser or in a WPF application, you can go home in the evening and use it to blow up aliens or plant crops, depending on your particular preferences. So yeah, that's, you, you edit that code. And if I just click play, we should go into play mode. So we are at the point in the tutorial, I love this, it works with an Xbox controller. It's a twin stick shooter, so you can point him in any direction and you're running around like this, and then he's got the, I'm pulling the trigger button to shoot him. We are at the point in the demo where uh, we have to do the thing that when a bullet hits a, a bad guy, the bad guy explodes. So at the moment, the bad guy does not explode. He's just disappeared off somewhere. The camera in this is actually worse than the camera in Tomb Raider 3. But I need to fix that. But yes, this, um, this took us, uh, we did this, got this far in a weekend with this book, and it was just a couple of hours on Saturday and a couple of hours on Sunday. Um, and, and it just works. And you can do that, that's using C Sharp. Um, you can do it using JavaScript, but don't. And you can pull in quite a lot of things from the .NET framework. It doesn't like NuGet at the moment, um, but once they pull it up to scratch and it starts working with .NET Standard, then you'll be able to use a .NET Standard library that's got some logic in it for doing like communication with leaderboards or something. And then you could use that in a Unity application, you could use it in a um, Xamarin application in your iOS or Android game. Um, you can just, you know, you could write a Unity application that pulls in the system.data.sql client library and talks to a SQL database so that when you have to do your database cleanup, you make them all appear as robot tables and you run around shooting the tables. Um, yeah, that sounds good. Do you ever see that? Was, someone did a, a fork of Doom where all the processes on the Unix box were represented as demons. Um, and they had their process ID number floating over their heads, and if you did, if you shot a demon with a rocket launcher, it did kill minus nine. Um, so yes, so that's cool. Um, Unity, uh, they work very closely with Microsoft. They're like a Microsoft super platinum titanium coated um, diamond partner or something. Uh, so Unity is currently the easiest way to write applications for HoloLens. And now we have mixed reality coming along. We've got Windows mixed reality, and you can go and into Curry's and just pick up a standard virtual reality headset. I think the cheapest one is 300 quid, the Acer one. It's chunky and heavy, but it works. Um, and you can start creating these mixed reality experiences. Um, that's going to be just huge over the next uh, 10 years. We've got Magic Leap coming out this year developer kits, and you're going to be able to use Unity and therefore .NET and C Sharp to build all these experiences, at which point it suddenly starts to make more sense that you want to include system.data.sql clients into your Unity application, because maybe what you want to do is pull uh, order statistics out of the database and render them floating on top of somebody's desk, and if they want to zoom in on a particular region, they can reach out with their hands and go like this. This, technically, is the reason I've given my wife why I'm learning Unity and need to buy a mixed reality headset. She bought it, so, you know, that works for me. Um, so, yes, uh, if you haven't had a chance to play with Unity, it's completely free until you get to the point where you have a game that you want to publish and start charging people money for. So, building an Android version of a game or an iOS version of a game uh, you have to pay for the professional license, but it's a subscription thing, and it's like 20 bucks a month. It's really not very much. And then there's another tier that you have to go up to if your game makes more than a lot of money in, a, in the course of a year. But it's, that is the point at which you would be going, this is my job now, I make games. And so you would be able to um, afford that in theory. So you can go to unity3d.com and download that and start playing with it any time you like. Uh, that just done the demo, and I would like to properly credit the lead developer on this project. That's, uh, those are my kids. Um, that's my daughter, Willow, dressed as Ray. Uh, she is 11 years old, and she is the only person I have ever pair programmed with where I haven't gone, oh, give me the fucking keyboard at any point during the process. She wrote all the code, she filled in all the values in Unity. Um, she is really amazingly smart. Uh, she's gonna grow up to be a much better programmer than I am, I hope. Um, so yes, and the little one's Ben, 
and he likes to build things out of cardboard and then break them. Um, and we have, we've got a new project. Uh, did anyone play Disney Infinity? Um, or Skylanders, or do, they, do your kids play it? So, the, you know the Toys to Life games that you see in Toys R Us and game and places like that? You get little plastic toys and they've got an NFC chip in the bottom and you have a base that plugs into your Xbox or your PlayStation and you put the character on the base and then it appears in the game and you can start using it and running around. And my little boy, Ben, was hugely into Disney Infinity. I mean, obsessed with it. Because um, it had a building mode, it's a bit like Minecraft and you get components and build your own levels and we'd do this hide and seek thing where you'd pick something up and go and hide it somewhere and then the other person would have to go and find it, which he came up with and which Nintendo have just released as a mode for Super Mario Odyssey. So I'm thinking game designer. Um, and then Disney went, we're not doing this anymore. It's only making us $250 million a year. That's not enough, we're Disney. Um, so they shut the development studio down. And so he's been going, when I grow up, I'm going to make Disney Infinity 4.0. So when I get home, I have waiting for me a 3D printer which I got on Kickstarter last year. And I've got a bag of NFC chips, which cost like 20p each, um, and a reader writer that works with a Raspberry Pi. And I'm going to download uh, pirated 3D models of Disney characters off the internet. And we are going to use the 3D printer to print the characters. We're going to stick the NFC chips in the bottom, and we're going to use Unity 3D to create our own version of Disney Infinity. And that's our project for the year. And I'll be putting all that on YouTube. And if you've got kids who are into tech or you think they like to get into tech and they want to follow along with that, it's all going to be open source. We're going to stick everything up on YouTube. Um, and we're going to start that soon. So yes, it's going to be very amateurish and rubbish, but it will make us happy. Um, you don't have to be amateurish and rubbish, though. There are some not quite AAA, but certainly AA games coming out now that are written in Unity. Uh, current one is Cuphead. Has anyone played Cuphead? Yeah? It's Bloody hard, isn't it? It's like proper old school 1980s video game hard. That was written in Unity. Um, Stardew Valley, that was written in Unity. Uh, completely different style of game. That was written in Unity as well. Um, and Super Hot was written at a game jam. The original idea for Super Hot was written at a game jam. That's written in Unity as well. Um, one thing I learned about while kind of researching this and looking at Super Hot is there is a plugin for Unity that you can get from the asset store called Pro Builder. Uh, which actually lets you build your model so you don't have to like use Blender or 3ds Max or anything like that. You can actually just create a cube and then chip away at it and turn it into what you want inside the Unity interface. So that's yeah, Pro Builder. That's free. There's a Pro version, so Pro Builder Pro. Um, so yes, you know, we're creating kind of uh, fairly ganky, rubbish things, um, but we're hoping to get better. But people are using this to create uh, proper games that you can download on Steam that they charge you 20 quid for, and you kind of go, yep, yeah, that was worth 20 quid. Um, and it's not just Unity 3D. Unity 3D is the most mature game engine that supports C Sharp, but there's a game engine called Godot, which is open source, which has its own language, but that in the next version, they've got alpha support for using C Sharp as the scripting language. There's Mono Game, which is fully open source, mono based uh, game design language. That's pretty good. Um, that's, that's mature, and people build stuff with that. Uh, and Unreal Engine, which is now open source, and you can download Unreal Engine itself from GitHub and build it on your machine, as long as you've got 64 gigs of RAM spare. Um, but there is a mono Unreal Engine plugin that lets you use C Sharp as your kind of game logic and AI and everything for Unreal as well, so you can do all that sort of stuff. And then we've got everything else that's going on in the world of .NET at the moment, because .NET Core means we can now write applications on Windows and Mac, and we've got cross-platform editors. We've got Visual Studio for Mac, which is pretty good. Uh, you've got Rider, uh, which is from JetBrains, and you can run that on Windows, Mac, and Linux, and it's pretty much the same experience on all of them. Um, you've got Visual Studio Code, which runs on all three platforms, and is pretty much the same experience on all of them. Uh, we can compile our applications to run on traditional Intel, AMD, 32-bit, and 64-bit, but now we can compile it to run on ARM as well. So you can take your .NET Core, ASP.NET Core application and stick it on a Raspberry Pi. And 
just bung that in the corner and run it. You can write Internet of Things stuff to run on Arduino boards and tiny little maker boards and so forth. And now there's even a library that lets you use CUDA instructions from inside your C-sharp code. So if you've got something massively parallel that you need to do, like AI processing, that sort of stuff, you can directly access the CUDA cores on your um, NVIDIA GPU. We can take this code that we've written in .NET and we can run it inside Docker containers and we can publish the Docker containers to the registry and then we can pull them down into Kubernetes clusters and we can run them in Kubernetes clusters and monitor them with standard monitoring tools like Prometheus and InfluxDB and that's supported. There's an app.metrics library for .NET Core that supports Influx and Prometheus and all these cloud native kind of technologies. So all those modern ways of doing everything, we're finally caught up with. We don't have to go, oh God, how much is it gonna cost us to deploy a Windows server with 16 cores? And then sort it, deploy a Linux server with eight cores and run .NET Core on it. We can run, uh, so Azure and AWS and Google Cloud have all got really good first class support, not only for all their platform as a service, things like DynamoDB or S3 storage or table storage or Bigtable or whatever it might be, if you use Google Cloud, right, and you're using the SDK stuff to talk to the Google services, you're using code that John Skeet wrote, which means your application is by default one of the best applications in the world because it's got John Skeet code in it, right? So yes. Um, not only that, though, each of these platforms has its own serverless architecture. So you've got Azure Functions, AWS Lambda, and Google's thing. Um, and those all support .NET Core 2.0 now as well. So you can write C-sharp code, just a, just a method, a class with a method, and then publish it into Lambda or into Azure Functions, and then just send it information, trigger it, and it's just, you have parameters and it gets called. Um, and yeah, that's really cool. Uh, pretty soon you'll be able to do uh, native compile that and then throw it up there, and then it'll start up as quickly as you saw the slidey thing start up there. And best of all, all of this stuff, all this .NET Core and ASP.NET Core and all these cool things that they're doing are happening in the open, on GitHub, fully open source. If you're going through the code and going, I can see how to do that a better way, or there's a mistake there, or whatever, then you can fork it and fix it and send them a pull request. Or you can do what Adam Ralph does, which is to fix the white space formatting and send them a pull request. Still gets your name on the list of contributors. Um, come to PubConf if you want to hear more about that from Adam himself. So yes. Given all this cool stuff that you can do with .NET, I'm not saying there's nothing else out there that's of any interest. I'm learning Rust. Rust is great. I like Rust. There are things that I would use Rust for. Um, I'm learning other things all the time. Learning other languages is a great way to learn to use your primary language better in a lot of cases. I never understood the whole concept of yield in I enumerables until I used Ruby um, and had block iterators. And I was kind of like, oh, this is what C Sharp's doing with for each. Um, so yes, there's lots of stuff out there and it's good to, to keep interested and to broaden your horizons and to play with things, but there's absolutely no reason to leave anything because it's an incredibly dynamic ecosystem, it's an incredibly dynamic community, it's full of wonderful people who are doing very exciting things. There's an endless amount of stuff you could do with it for the rest of your life and never run out of things. And I love it, and I hope I've um, managed to express some of how much I love it to all of you guys. And maybe send you away with something that you're gonna go, I'm gonna try that tomorrow. If not, sodger. Thanks very much for coming, I'll see you next year. Cheers, bye.